Probiotics are more than a $35 billion business globally, and they shouldn't be. Did I catch your attention with the title? Good. This is information you should know. To the best of my knowledge, nobody else on the planet has put together the information you're about to see. So watch the full presentation and learn important information that can save you time, money, health, and hassle. So let's get started. Before I get into the introduction and background information and risk losing your interest, let me hit you with something. Here from a paper literally entitled Lactobacillus, the not-so-friendly bacteria, we see how L. paracaceae from a probiotic was confirmed as the cause of bacteremia and a liver abscess in the 65-year-old diabetic patient. This resulted in a hospital stay of six weeks. But this can't be right. Lactobacillus species are supposed to be good for you, right? There is more, much more. Then there is the 69-year-old who had a severe infection from Lactobacillus plantarum, which also is a common probiotic. The authors state that as the number of immunocompromised patients increases, we should be cautious regarding this familiar microbe. These papers reference just two cases, but there are far more than you would think. This is a recent review from 2023 focusing on Lactobacillus bacteremia. In discussing many individual cases, they talk about how Lactobacilli can act as opportunistic pathogens causing bacteremia, endocarditis, liver and dental abscesses, and prosthetic knee infections. The point is that Lactobacillus, under the conditions of dysbiosis, which is an unhealthy balance of the bacteria in your gut, acts like an opportunistic pathogen. And although Lactobacillus bacteremia is more common in those who take probiotics, the Lactobacillus can also come from your own gut, as shown here in Table 2. And in Table 3, they highlight those cases associated with Lactobacillus probiotic use. They also mention three other reviews looking at a total of 263 cases. And this is just bacteremia. It doesn't include abscesses, endocarditis, and more. So why do the vast majority of Lactobacillus customers not develop grave infections? Because those who are most susceptible are those with cancer, the immunocompromised, those with diabetes, or severe GI issues. But wait, people certainly take lactobacillus for GI issues, and probably for diabetes and the immune system as well. So let's get into the introduction and highlight a huge array of data. Let me begin by saying that probiotics do help some of the people some of the time. When I say probiotics, I'm referring to those that are in supplement form that probably have viable bacteria in sufficient quantity which stand a slight chance of making an impact on your gastrointestinal function. Usually, probiotics come in a blend of various species from the genera Bifidobacterium and Lactobacillus. So, any benefit that some people may get from probiotics is statistically likely from Bifidobacterium as the data shows that this genus is generally health-promoting. As for Lactobacillus, it's a very different story. With the exception of infant and vaginal health, lactobacillus is a very bad idea for dysbiotic adults, which is most people. Recently, the species were reclassified into various similar sounding genera and species, but to keep things simple, we're going to refer to them all as lactobacillus, which is still commonly the case even in the scientific literature. Years ago, when I was in my first few years as director of medical education for a microbiome firm, I kept finding ugly data points for lactobacillus. I was surprised, as that's not what I was expecting to see. But I followed the data. Then in June of 2020, 60 Minutes had an episode on probiotics, and it wasn't very flattering. Finally, someone is seeing the same thing I was seeing. Then in August, two months later, this comprehensive technical review came out, and once again, the probiotic world took a shot to the chin. Among many statements, they say that, quote, however, probiotics are a source of significant cost with unclear benefit. How unclear? They focused on eight clinical uses, of which three prominent ones are highlighted on this slide. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. Among many other statements the authors made, here are a few in regards to each of the three conditions, and again, not flattering. 
Now let's put these commercial probiotics you've been buying into context. We're going to use the term abundance, or to say, their count in comparison to other bacteria who also comprise the microbiome. Here we see the top 50 most abundant genera found from a group of healthy controls in two large databases. These taxa are fairly representative of what a healthy microbiome looks like, although they do vary between studies. In the top 50, lactobacillus comes in at 39th most abundant. Which proven health-promoting genera are more abundant? All those with green arrows. They are the genera determining health. And all of those orange arrows point to genera which house opportunistic pathogens, all of which are more abundant than lactobacillus. And these bad actors are kept in check by those genera with green arrows. With the exception of bifidobacterium, the beneficial bacteria on this slide are not available as probiotics in the marketplace, but you can feed them the fuels they love. This whole probiotic obsession got started with Ilya Mechnikov in the Rhodope Mountains of southern Bulgaria. It was thought that their healthy aging and supposed longevity were due to their consumption of fermented dairy products. However, modern scientists attribute their longevity to other common factors seen in blue zones around the world. In fact, when I compile all of the data points from my healthy aging meta-analysis, which includes nine centenarian studies and 13 frailty studies, we get an excellent idea of the microbiome and the healthy aged. Nowhere on here do you see lactobacillus. It doesn't factor into the aging microbiome in one direction or the other. What you see are other key players which come up time and time again. Names with which you're unlikely familiar, but you'll know better by the end of this presentation. Now, let's take a look at this one special genus, which is for all intents and purposes a genus with one species, Fecalibacterium prausensii. This is what the profile looks like for the superhero of the gut, Fecalibacterium prausensii. These many data points come from a number of meta-analyses I've done across multiple diseases slash conditions. As you can see, when a significant difference was found in these human fecal microbiome studies, almost all of the time, the healthy controls had significantly higher levels of F. prausensii as compared to the disease cohorts. This is indicated by the color green. Or said another way, the disease subjects had significantly lower levels of F. prausensii as compared to healthy controls. This, on the other hand, is the profile for lactobacillus. It's very different, as you can see. The majority of the time, the disease subjects have significantly more lactobacillus in their microbiomes than the healthy controls when a significant difference was found in a study. Look at IBS, for example. Millions of people take probiotics for IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And yet studies show that most of the time, the IBS subjects have significantly more lactobacillus in their intestines than do healthy controls. So if you have IBS, why would you want to add more lactobacillus to your gut when healthy controls have less than you? This color-coded profile here is what you see for opportunistic pathogens. They are bad actors waiting for an unhealthy change in the gut environment which favors them. And when that happens, they do bad things. One way lactobacillus behaves like an opportunistic pathogen is in the presence of antibiotics. I have a whole presentation you can watch on this topic. But simply put, antibiotics are terrible for your microbiome, and there is a mountain of data to show that. As the microbiome is exposed to more and more antibiotics, the health-promoting bacteria die off and the bad actors, the opportunistic pathogens, increase in their abundance. This is just one study of many I could show you. Here we have 16 healthy, brave souls who took Cipro, vancomycin, and metronidazole for seven days. The colors in the heat map, figure C, indicate logarithmic changes, a black, a reduction, and white, an increase. The green arrows point to the health promoters I've established over the years. You can see massive differences from day zero to the collection of the fecal samples on day nine. Several key health promoters were reduced over 100 fold, while a classic opportunistic pathogen, Streptococcus, was significantly increased, as was the genus Lactobacillus, 
your probiotic behaving like a bad actor. We see the same in this antibiotic study. Within the blue rectangle, you can see at nine days post antibiotics, drastic changes from day zero in the colors which represent the abundance of various genera. Most obvious is a huge increase in the color red, which represents the genus Streptococcus, a genus full of bad actors we just saw. Also again, we see a huge increase in lactobacillus in purple. The authors go on to state, quote, we observed profound changes shortly after the course of antibiotics, with a drop in microbial diversity, overgrowth of the genera Streptococcus and lactobacillus, and an early loss of anaerobic bacterial taxa with important roles in short-chain fatty acid metabolism. That last part, anaerobic taxa with roles in short-chain fatty acid metabolism, those are the health promoters. On the topic of antibiotics, many people take probiotics while on antibiotics, thinking it can help. Not so fast. In this very comprehensive and invasive study, these researchers administered a substantial antibiotic regimen and then measured in detail how the microbiomes recovered over 180 days in three arms. Natural recovery, by fecal microbiota transfer, or with probiotic supplementation. Fecal microbiota transfer was the clear winner. Natural recovery was in second place, although three key health-promoting taxa never fully recovered, which is often seen after antibiotic use. And the use of probiotics in the post-antibiotic recovery had the undesirable effect of significantly delaying microbiome recovery until the end of the study and causing a bloom in Enterococcus, which is a genus with terrible opportunistic pathogens. Not only did probiotics not help, it made things worse. You'd be better off not taking them at all when on antibiotics. Another way lactobacillus acts like an opportunistic pathogen is with PPI use, proton pump inhibitors. These two are terrible for your microbiome. And there is also a mountain of evidence for this. And I also have a presentation dedicated to this topic. PPIs dramatically reduce good bacteria in the gut and significantly increase the bad. In this study, classic opportunistic pathogens like Enterococcus, Escherichia, Streptococcus, and Veonella were significantly increased with PPI use. You know what else was? Lactobacillus. And also in this PPI study. And in this PPI study. And in this PPI study. I think you get the idea. Antibiotics and PPIs are so terrible for the gut microbiome that they are huge risk factors for the pinnacle of dysbiosis, a C. diff infection, which can be very costly to hospitals and is a huge cause of morbidity and mortality. In fact, Antibiotic use is the number one risk factor for a C. diff infection. How? By altering the microbiome for the worse. Here is a chart of mine after a meta-analysis of the microbiome in various factors for C. diff. I used 30 human fecal microbiome studies in total. The blue box lists the range of cohorts. This is the microbial signature of C. diff. Again, the orange color indicates an unhealthy association while the green indicates healthy. Enterococcus, Escherichia, Veonella, and once again, your probiotic, Lactobacillus, are all highly correlated with C. diff in one way or another. These people are health compromised, which is one of the risk factors for a Lactobacillus infection we saw earlier. I must be crazy shattering the Lactobacillus myth. You can't believe your eyes and ears. Lactobacillus must be good for a condition in the dysbiotic healthy adults. Actually, no, it's not. The data across the board is ugly. Let's just look at dementia in this slide. This is the microbial fingerprint for dementia. Again, I have a presentation dedicated to this. As you can see, those with dementia have significant reductions in key health-promoting taxa, such as E. rectale, F. prausitzii, ruminococcus, and more, shown in green and they have significantly elevated levels of certain taxa to include lactobacillus. So if you suffer from dementia, and the studies show that dementia subjects tend to have more lactobacillus in their gut microbiome than healthy controls, then why in the world would you think it would be a good idea to add lactobacillus? Here we see the same thing with Parkinson's disease. 
In this microbial fingerprint, we see many of the usual suspects. And in Parkinson's, most of the time, when a significant difference was found, the Parkinson's subjects had significantly more lactobacillus in their microbiome than the healthy controls. But here we can explain part of most of this with drug metabolism. You see, the microbiome possesses thousands of enzymes which have a myriad of activities. Some of them can play large roles in drug metabolism, as we see here with Parkinson's drugs. Species of lactobacillus are shown to metabolize two key Parkinson's drugs. Their enzymes allow them to feed off of these drugs. It's fuel for them. And the more fuel you give them, like anything, the more they thrive. Therefore, if you're relying on these drugs to help with your Parkinson's symptoms, then you should definitely not take lactobacillus. It can reduce the effect of your drugs via gut metabolism. So the $35 billion question is, is lactobacillus actively a bad actor or guilty by association? Well, in the dysbiotic microbiome, it's a contributor to a disease-promoting environment. And in this environment, it is generally a weak opportunistic pathogen, but can be deadly. If you look at this very simplistic representation of the microbiome, you see lactobacillus grouped together with two other classic opportunistic pathogens, Enterococcus and Streptococcus, within the order Lactobacillulase. Because of this similarity in genetic content, it can behave pathogenically. In many ways, it behaves like an opportunistic pathogen. It thrives outside of the pH Goldilocks zone. Its presence increases with PPIs and antibiotics. It can adhere to cells and is tolerant of oxygen. In fact, it's what's called a facultative anaerobe, which means it can survive with and without oxygen. Do you know what other bacteria are facultative anaerobes? Enterococcus, a very bad acting genus, which I often highlight. Haemophilus influenzae, as in meningitis, pneumonia, and sinusitis. Streptococcus, as in strep throat, but it can be a nasty infection just about anywhere in the body. Staphylococcus, as in those nasty hospital staph infections like MRSA, Salmonella, E. coli, Yersinia pestis, as in the plague, and others. I'm not saying lactobacillus is the plague. I'm saying it has genetic material in common with these bad actors, which is quite opposite of the true health promoters like F. prausitzii, E. rectale, and species from the genera Roseburia, Coprococcus, Ruminococcus, and others. These are butyrate-producing, oxygen-intolerant superstars who thrive in the ideal pH of the gut and who are reduced with PPIs and antibiotics and whose abundance is consistently significantly higher in healthy controls versus all diseases slash conditions I've analyzed to date. In the previous slide, I mentioned that lactobacillus can be a contributor to a disease-promoting environment. How so? Well, lactobacillus is one of many different bacteria in the microbiome which produce lactate, but one of a few which produce it as a primary end product. And it's this lactate which helps drive down the pH. But lactobacillus does so robustly and with high acid tolerance. Under normal healthy conditions, there are lactate-consuming bacteria, some of which are highly beneficial, which keep lactate levels in check at very low thresholds, like these guys here. However, if this threshold is crossed, in the case of dysbiosis, then a spiral of lactate production decreases pH, which disables the consumption of lactate from the good bacteria, and can switch to feed other lactate consumers who are bad bacteria, such as E. coli, C. diff, Campylobacter, and Salmonella, as shown here. This condition is referred to as lactate accumulation and is seen especially in surgical removal of portions of the small and large intestine, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. As you can see here in this ulcerative colitis study, lactate levels clearly increase with increasing severity. As the lactate accumulation worsens, the all-important short-chain fatty acids are reduced. In a nutshell, we're talking about which bacteria are happiest in which environment. And sadly, the good guys are happy in a narrow range like Goldilocks. Our planet is in the Goldilocks zone from the sun, not too hot, not too cold. While the health-promoting bacteria are much the same, not too acidic and not too basic. 
If it is, then they get outcompeted for resources. And when they do, they can't do good things. And the bad guys who can survive and thrive outside the zone can do bad things. To continue with ulcerative colitis, as we see here, and yet another of my meta-analyses, looking at the human fecal microbiomes of diseased subjects versus healthy controls, we see that in 11 studies, when a significant difference was found between the two cohorts, nine of those times, the ulcerative colitis subjects had significantly more species from lactobacillus as compared to the healthy controls. So again, I ask, if there's so much lactobacillus in the gut of these sick people, it's obviously, at best case scenario, not doing any good, and at worst case, causing grave problems. So why would you take a lactobacillus-containing probiotic? It makes no sense. So let's leave the environmental shifting powers of lactate accumulation and revisit the worst case scenario, which is how we get started off in this presentation, that of lactobacillus being an opportunistic pathogen. And keep in mind that lactobacillus infection cases are considered to be underreported. In this paper, again, we have review of cases from different authors. This time, instead of bacteremia, we're talking about liver abscesses caused by various species from lactobacillus. In Table 1, you can see that the offending species, all of which are available as probiotics, were varied. But how are these members of probiotics pathogenic? Well, in short, an inflammatory environment can change gene expression. This is not unique to lactobacillus. Opportunistic pathogens become more opportunistic with environmental shift. As for lactobacillus, their pathogenic features mimic those of other bad actors, such as the ability to bind to intestinal mucosa, to adhere to extracellular matrix proteins, such as collagen, to aggregate platelets, their production of certain enzymes, which may help break down tissues, biofilm formation, and adherence to human vascular endothelial cells. And in this paper, we have an individual case report and a review. This case report is interesting because it highlights a couple of points. One, this ulcerative colitis patient was taking a common probiotic, Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, which was proven to be the cause of her bacteremia. And two, as an ulcerative colitis patient, like for Crohn's disease and so many other patients, immunosuppressant drugs are commonly prescribed. However, as we learned, immunosuppression is a risk factor for lactobacillus infections. In fact, immunosuppression is so common that an investigation published in 2018 found that almost one in five people in New York and one in six people in Sydney, Australia, and even more for the age group 60 to 64, could be considered immunosuppressed. Hence, the authors of this paper state, quote, pending conclusive evidence, use of probiotics should be considered with caution in cases of active severe inflammatory bowel diseases with mucosal disruption. And you can see in table two, powerful comments from other papers, like lactobacillus species are opportunistic pathogens and references to mortality ranging from a quarter to one half of patients. In this last review on pathogenicity, also from different authors, they just looked at the years 2019 to 21. On this first table, which just looks at endocarditis patients, among many other things, you can see that diabetes is an underlying risk factor. And in the second table, which looks at non-endocarditis slash bacteremia, you can see diabetes listed many more times. And speaking of diabetes, I have one last chart to torture you with. Since diabetes is a proven risk factor for lactobacillus infections, I've compiled my microbiome data for diabetes and obesity, since the two of them often go hand in hand. As you can see here, the microbial picture for these two combined shows that species from lactobacillus are most often found elevated in these conditions as compared to healthy controls. The data is so bad, it's even worse than the family Enterobacteriaceae which is literally the worst family in the microbiome, a family full of nasty opportunistic pathogens. It's where E. coli comes from. That's how ugly the lactobacillus data is here. These taxes you see here are the true health promoters of the microbiome. I have spent thousands of hours of work diligently collecting data, which culminate in this slide. 
These health-promoting bacteria have been found to be consistently, significantly higher in healthy cohorts and significantly lower in the unhealthy ones across all diseases. The darker the green, the stronger the data as a health promoter. Out of a thousand or more species in your gut, this handful plays an enormous role in your health. There are a few health promoting bacteria not listed here like Bifidobacterium, Allostypes, and Odoribacter, which are in other phyla, but these listed here are the main determinants of health in the gut. These incredible bacteria can also occupy a lot of real estate and perform many health promoting functions beyond the highly beneficial one of butyrate production. They don't exist as probiotics, but in order to increase their number, you have to feed them the fuels they love. By doing so, you drastically improve your microbiome and by extension, your overall health. So in review, if you are a healthy person and you want to consume lactobacillus containing probiotics or yogurt or fermented foods, then fine. Will it do you some good? Maybe, maybe not. However, given antibiotics usage, PPI use, horrific diets, stress, and more, most people are dysbiotic to one degree or another. The data clearly shows that most of the time, those who are ill have more lactobacillus than those who are healthy. So why add more? Don't. Now that you know this information that no one else knows, use a more intelligent approach for your health, one which considers all the data and is proven to work. Stop wasting your money and time going in circles. Listen to the expert. If you found this presentation informative, I have many more for free in my YouTube channel and also in the Microbiome University tab on my website, themicrobiomeexpert.com. There you can select from a wide variety of topics. And if you or a loved one are struggling with a disease slash condition, I have condition-specific presentations as well, along with their microbiome protocols found within its respective tab on my website.